Hello everybody, I am Ardhendu De. You are watching Edis English Literature. Today, we are going to read My Last Duchess by Robert Browning. We will analyze its poetic devices, structure, themes, notably as a dramatic monologue, and find out key other features in the poem. Also, the four characters, Duke, Duchess, Envoy to Count, and that Fra Pandolf, the artist, that pops up in the discussion or indirect speech or indirect speech are the four major characters in this poem. We will analyze these characters and why they pop up in this poem and what are the purpose they serve in the poetic text. But first of all, we will first find out what is dramatic monologue. Dramatic and monologue are the two terms. The poem now has a lot of accent and the speaker uses his voices to make the tale more lively. Thus a dramatic monologue according to Browning is a thorough soliloquy in which a specific vital time in one's life is seized and by allowing the individual to articulate its character the entire path of his existence is disclosed in a such light. So, by definition, this is one person's speech. It is presented without overanalysis or commentary, emphasizing subjective elements that are left to the listeners to perceive. This approach first gained prominence in the works of Robert Browning. Although his wife is renowned as a poet, was hired than his own during his lifetime, Robert Browning is now regarded as one of the Victorian era's greatest heroes, greatest poets. He is best known for creating this dramatic monologue. We have in fact several of his dramatic monologues that are very interesting. His dramatic monologue is a kind of a psychological understanding. He is most known and best appreciated for creating his dramatic monologue. This dramatic monologue is in fact a psychological understanding of the character he projects. The powerful and colloquial lyrical style makes it a permanent seat in English literature. As you are surely aware, Robert Browning's brilliance was primarily theatrical. His favorite form is the dramatic monologue and uh, like that of a psychologist, his major goal is to research the events that contribute to the formation of the soul. Browning found this uh, to shape a perfectly a suitable character projections through his dramatic monologue. Now Browning's purpose is to project the very character in its truest favor never to indulge into analysis but to project it so it's a kind of open-ended even though the dramatic monologue i must say is popular but in true poetry uh, drama and poetry is never go parallel you know uh, the subjective poetry and objective poetry the division is there the subjective poetry tells about the inner core of thought of the poet but in objective poetry, there is the more discussions of the uh, external characters of their own voices. So the author is omitting there. The dramatic arts or dramatic presentations are in the form of objective art. So how the poetry should depict a drama? Now that question had been asked. But what is notably interesting in Robert Browning's writing, Robert Browning's dramatic monologue is its presentations of the character and the tug of war, emotional always, and uh, certain kind of character who is more uh, psychotic than, and, and, and it's uh, like a telling of the facts of mind. Now, a few of the, apart from a few of the lover poems, we can indulge into the, or dive deep into character's philosophy or character's psychology and it's quite interesting one. If you read minutely, you will find that My Last Duchess is the most often anthologized theatrical monologue by Robert Browning. There is a single speaker as is uh, as in all of his theatrical monologues. The speaker in My Last Duchess is the Duke of Ferrara. 
you probably know that Browning composed My Last Duchess as a part of his collection Dramatic Lyrics in 1842. The poem is generally believed to be based on the marriage of Alfonso and Lucrezia, the Duke of Ferrara and the Duchess of Ferrara. Alfonso married Lucrezia when he was 25 years old and she was only 14. And though her family was considered beneath his social ladder, she came with a sizable dowry. In fact, Lucrezia was then abandoned and died two years later at the age of 16. While the true circumstances regarding her death is never told, but it is presumed that she was poisoned. The poem plays on this with the speaker of the poem, presumably Alfonso, showing the portrait of his wife to a guest. In the historical context, we might guess that this guest is none other than Nicholas Matruj, the courier of the Count of Tyrol, the father of the woman Alfonso was quoting. Now the portrait had been hidden behind a curtain so that none but those the speaker chose could see it. The speaker presumably Alfonso, Duke of Ferrara that, that I have told you, is criticizing his late duchess and talking about her flaws. Through his own statement, the Duke unwittingly reveals that he was directly or indirectly responsible for the duchess death. It is strange and quite startling to learn that Duchess demise was caused by her natural and universal states of love, filler feelings, compassion and smiles. And the Duke is male chauvinistic, dictatorial and a kind of positive person. The Duke's complaint of the Duchess flirting with everyone actually refers to her quality of casual courtesy and response to her well wishers, uh, which was misinterpreted by the Duke. Why she smiled? Why she smiled at everything, everybody? Because she is an enjoying character. She is a character who loves everybody. She has a broader human heart. The way she felt exclusive importance to the Duke's gift of 900 years old legacy however is infuriated him and made him to make some heinous deeds. We are nonetheless made aware that he committed the murder and the smiling duchess put into death. But you must uh, remember that the duke is perhaps Alfonso, fifth duke of Fena. He married Lucrezia de Medici in 1558 the historical fact it is when she was only 15 she died in 1561 perhaps by poisoning here the duke is exhibiting the portrayal of his former wife to the envoy the basis of his character is the complacent egotism of the aristocrat who regards his wife as, as property and that male chauvinistic character is uh, here revealed he cannot break her graciousness and innocence gaiety and finally out of envy, out of jealousy, murders her. Now before we begin reading this poem, I must say that this structurally this poem is binding one. The rhyme scheme seems uh, odd and disjointed but here is iambic pentameter lines. Uh, sometimes. Uh, there is some occasional um, or minor deviations from this but uh, this kind of uh, disjointed phrases sometimes also reflects a disturbance of the character the speaker's mind the psychotic the jealous the male chauvinistic character that we will find in Duke is being quite exhibited in his disjointed speech otherwise there is a rhythmic flow by make pentameter here here is also some beautiful rhetorical flourishes. You can find out alliteration, suzura, enjambment. All is serving the purpose of rhythm and rhyming features also reflects the character that are speaking. The dramatic intensity of the poem is binding one with flow of rhetorical flourishes here. 
now next if i say what is the theme of this particular poem we can say okay here we can find out a kind of love or interpretation of love or perspective of love in different angles both from the view from duke of ferrera as well as the last duchess who is no more there is another part of jealousy the possessiveness malchopinism and obviously uh, the concept of marriage in the upper strata of european society is also being reflected in this particular poem here we begin reading this poem my last duchess the scene is at ferrara the very castle and the duke is pointing out to a picture and he speaks to it to the convoy that's my last touches painted on the wall looking as if she were alive my last touches begins with the speaker inviting the listener to sit and gaze at a portrait of his duchess of his last touches in fact the readers are left wondering why and how this duchess is no longer his current duchess so the inquisitive or the very query sets forth at the very beginning however the speaker remains silent on whether she is dead or imprisoned in a convent the interest in the poem is that he invites his audience to take a seat and gaze at a life size portrait of her he reveals that this painting is hidden behind a curtain and that only he is permitted to draw the curtain to view and or to show the painting to others this is extremely untrustworthy behavior the reader can tell right away that the duke is in charge but why is this happening that is the question that yet to be answered so the poem begins with lot of queries with lot of unanswered queries and the readers like us is interested in reading further what will happen or why is this happening i call that piece a wonder now fra pandlob's hands worked busily a day and there she stands who is fra pandlob it's an imaginary character who might be a painter well acquainted who might have drawn the very picture of the duchess next the duke says will it please you sit and look at her i said prop and drop by design for never read stand just like you that pictured continents the depth and passion of its earnest glance but to myself they turned since none put by the curtain i have drawn for you but i and seemed as they would ask me if they dust how such a glance came there so not the first are you to turn and ask thus sir it was not her husband's presence only call that spot of joy into the duchess check perhaps now the positive duke exhibits his character that he is none other than an autocrat husband a husband or a male chauvinistic husband who is against all sort of liberty that the women enjoys and the smiling even in the picture in the content in the in the very pictures descriptions of the duchess who is smiling a face is being questioned or rather she has the smiling face which does not have the approval of the duke the duke describes the look of the duchess face and that she had a joyous look and an earnest glance he notes that it was not her husband's presence only called that spot of joy into duchess check this is an odd thing to say 
why would he think that his mere presence without anything else would bring delight to her face? He does not answer the question. But the fact that he mentions it offers some insight into why he was the only one authorized to open the curtain. So the positive nature of the Duke is obvious from the initial few lines here. He had always hoped to be the only one to bring a smile to his Duchess face, you know. He could be the only one to ever see the smiles of ecstasy on her face. Now that she has thrown away somewhere and her life-size portrait on the wall because he would not allow anyone else to look at the painting without his permission. Suddenly we find that Duke is here like that of a crazy. Why does he pick so? It is quite obvious that when, when the Duchess was alive, she might have been tormented. She might have been alive without even a single breath she cannot have in her own will. Even being transformed into a portrait, even being transformed into a portrait of the gallery, even her smile is to be controlled by the certain curtain and that curtain is been drawn with the whims of the Duke. Such is the positive nature of the Duke in reference here. Now coming to the second sex, perhaps Pra Pandav chance to say her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much. Or paint must never hope to reproduce the paint her plus that dies along her throat. Such stuff. What could she? She thought and caused enough for calling up that spot of joy. She had a heart, how shall I say, to soon made glad, to easily impressed. She liked whatever she looked on and her looks went everywhere. The Duke seemed to be recalling his former Duchess and everything that annoyed him about her in this portion of my last Duchess. She seemed to be too delighted with everyone around her. This did not sit well with the Duke. He didn't like how she would blush if someone like Fra Pandolf, uh, even though we don't have that message who the Pap and Rolf is, but with hints, we can say that he is the very artist for whom uh, the Duchess might have a model. That Prep and Rolf told her that her soul covered her wrist too much. He didn't like it when she blushed, when another guy flirted with her. He didn't like how what he considered common decency would call up that spot of joy that she constantly appeared to have on her face. The Duke accuses. The Duke accuses her of having too soon made glad or too easily impressed. That's a peculiar heart, a womanly heart that is full of joy, full of life. But she was irritated by the fact that she enjoyed everything she looked at. As my last Duchess progresses, uh, this man appeared to be more and more crazy, dominating the attitudes he reveals. He seemed to have imprisoned his duchess because he was unable to manage her emotions or, or he was too much a restricted personage. He wanted to be the one, the only one who could make her happy or make her blush. Section 3 said it was all one, my favor at her breast, the dropping of the delight in the waist, the bow of cherries, some officious pool, broken the orchard for her, the white mule she rode, with round the taste, all and each would drop from her alike the approving speech, her blast at least. She thanked man. Gold, but thanked somehow 
I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of 900 years old name with anybody's gift. Who took to blame this sort of trifling? The Duke proceeds to reveal all of the defects in the Duchess character in these lines of my last Duchess. He claims she cherishes her white mule, a cherry blossom, and the sunset as much she values a piece of jewelry he gave her. He is angry that she does not seem to perceive the value in what he provides her, or what, or that she does not appear to cherish the simple joys of life as much as he does. He also appears upset that she does not seem to recognize the significance of his position in life. So the Duke is boosting one. Duke is robust in his whims and he is all positive and a crude persona. And he wishes to control that full of life misses or full of life Duchess. He had given her a 900 years old name by marrying her. This word particularly demonstrates that his family has been around for a long time and hence he married her with a well-known and prominent name. She did not appear to be thankful for it any more than she was for seeing the sunset. The Duke was so offended by that that he refused to stoop to her level to discuss it with her. He considers it trifling to do so. Even had you skill in speech, which I have not, to make your will quite clear to such an one, and say, just these or that in you disgust me, here you miss, and there exceeds the mark. If she let herself be listened so, nor plainly set her wits to yours for sooth and met excuse, even then would be some stooping, and I choose never to stoop. Oh, sir, she smiled no doubt whenever I passed her, but who passed without much the same smile? This grew. I gave commands, then all smiles stopped together. There she stands, as if alive. Will it please you rise? We will meet the company below then. <laughs> so here, uh, a simple tale or anecdote has been told here. The Duke goes on to say that he will never stop to discussing with his Duchess what made him so disgusted with her. Nonetheless, he appears to be at once disgusting. He considered himself to be too high and powerful to descend to talk to a woman, even if that lady was his wife. He confessed that she smiled at him and pleasantly as he walked by, but it worried him that she smiled at everyone. He stated that he gave commands and then all smiles stopped. This understandably makes the reader feel terrible about or for the Duchess that she is murdered. She was nice, cheerful, cheerful individual. The Duke seemed to have given her an order that caused her to see smiling entirely. With his domineering approach towards her, he deprived her of her joy. The Duke returns his attention to the portrait on the wall after narrating what happened when he comments her saying that she stands as if alive. This implies that the genuine Duchess is no longer living. The Duke appears to be pleased with the painting of her since he can control who sees the delight on her and who not. The Duke uh, then invites his listener to him to accompany him below because below some of the guests are waiting. In the last section, it reads, we will meet the company below then. I repeat, the Count, your master's known munificence, 
in ample event that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed. Though his fair daughter self, I avoid at starting is my object. Nay, we will go together down, sir. Notice Neptune, though, taming a seahorse, thought a rarity, which clause of inspect cast in brunch for me. The identity of the Duke's listener is revealed in this portion of the my last touches. He works for a count in the area and they are attempting to uh, arrange or rearrange a marriage between the Duke and the Count's daughter. The Duke uh, describes his beautiful daughter as his object. So uh, obviously uh, when a woman is an object, the male chauvinistic view of the Duke is obvious and he thinks women folk as an object, a property. And that's why he is in all heading towards controlling it instead of loving it. Uh, he leads the man back downstairs and they go. Uh, as they are going, he shows out the brunch monument sculpted especially for him. Uh, the monument it shows the Neptune uh, taming a seahorse. Neptune, of course, is the sea deity, as you know. This represents the Duke and the seahorse represents any duchess she may obtain. The Duke considers himself to be a god and he seeks to tame his wife so that he would be doing anything he wants to for her and even um, uh, whatever he wants her to feel. This man is mainly innocent and manipulative. I must say, the speaker in the my last touches reflects a sum total of hard soul, a sum total of male chauvinistic idiotism or a kind of barbaric. The clause of Innsbruck might be another fictitious name like that of Fred Landolph, who might be the culprit who has crafted. So, in the whole of this poem, uh, my last touches, I think you have gone through this poem or will read further to get the meaningful rendering of this poem. To in the Campena laboratory and such poems are also included my list of favorites of Robert Browning that you can read or if I have the time, I can also pass you in later part of my video lecture series. Before I end this video lecture, I might conclude a few words. The Duke describes the character of the last touches and he really brings out the bright side of her character. She is enthusiastic and she was one of the lonely women whose kindness and responsiveness are as natural as sunlight. She is always gay, gracious, full of courtesy to all and um, the Duke's narrow and jealous look cannot comprehend those meanings of smiles and he cannot cause the very depth of uh, his wife's plentiful humanism. He considers instead his wife as his property and her courtesy to others is regarded as the infringement of the rights of uh, that property. So the attitude of the Duke is very much contrasted with the attitude of the Duchess as he describes. Again, implied action and implied conversation are the characteristics of good dramatic monologue. The presence of the envoy for which the monologue is intended is very much suggestive here. His responses and actions are adequately hinted whenever we are going through this poem. His responses and actions are adequately hinted at. When the Duke speaks of the officious fool who brought the cherries and when he says all the smiles stop together, uh, the envoy looks at him with a fearful eyes, with fearful questions in his eyes. In fact, so I think you have gone through this poem and understood a bit. Now you can have your time, uh, try to understand the psychological insight the dramatic accents or in accents and the dramatic monologue types. So after going through this entire poem and reading several times, 
you can gaps the meaning of the characters that you prop up in these sections of the writing subscribe to my channel to get this kind of posts your comments your likes and suggestions are the very boost of my future course of video lectures bye bye looking forward to your positive reviews